Welcome to the Growth Ventures Podcast, the go-to platform for entrepreneurs, innovators, and change makers. I'm your host, Tamla Azari. In this podcast, we delve into the world of business, technology, and innovation. We bring you conversations with industry leaders, disruptors, and visionaries who are shaping the future and making a difference. So whether you're an aspiring entrepreneur, a seasoned business owner, or simply a curious listener, join us on the journey of learning and growth. Welcome to the Growth Ventures Podcast. And now, let's delve into today's episode. Welcome to the Growth Ventures Podcast, your go-to destination for insights into innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship. I'm Hamad Azarian, and today we're embarking on a journey with Walter DeBrower, a serial entrepreneur and academic whose work intersects healthcare, technology, and linguistics. Walter's journey from Belgium to the heart of Silicon Valley is a tale of relentless innovation and pioneering spirit. As the chief scientific officer at ShareCare, and with a rich background in semiotics, he brings a unique perspective to the intersection of technology and healthcare. Today, we'll delve into this world of AI, blockchain, and evolution of language in the age of artificial intelligence. Walter, thank you so much for joining us. It's really an honor and a pleasure to have you on our podcast for our listening audience. Thank you for coming today. Pleasure is all mine. So Walter, what we like to do for some of the new listeners is we like to kind of traverse through your personal journey, you know, looking at both your personally and your career wise, and really talking about overall the lessons learned along the way as, as you, you know, immigrated from Belgium to the U S and personally, all the path that you've taken. So why don't we get started a little bit that what, you grew up in Belgium. Can you tell me a little, I, you grew up, I think in a farm or a small village. Is that? Yeah. That yeah. So my. My grand, my grandparents had a farm, and uh, so yeah, you know that's why I never want want to farm <laughs> uh, because it's a lot of work and and uh, it's always you know you're always in the mud. There's always something to do. It's like capacity planning between the chicken, the rabbit, <laughs> the pigs, you know. Um, but a lot of people have a romance about a farm, and also in. Or in America with the ranch, I I have lost that uh, romance because uh, I wanted my also my father was uh, worked in a slaughterhouse, and I at a very young age I I saw him actually slaughtering cows. And I think uh, subconsciously I I decided to to become a theoretical scientist, <laughs> you know, far away from uh, all the practical things. And uh, so I went to Catholic education. Um, it's a very good education in Belgium. And uh, so, you know, went also there for uh, uh, to university. A university, I, I went to a, a public university because I thought, you know, 12 years of Catholic education, we have to see a bit of the, the other angle of the world. And, you know, when you're 18, uh, everyone is a sort of a... Uh, you know, um, more socialist, Marxist, uh, and uh, but then you know, at some point, you decide you drank enough cheap wine, <laughs> and uh, and you know, you become something else. And I did my PhD later on uh, in Holland, you know, which is very close to to Belgium. And uh, so I wanted to be a physicist. Or a mathematician was, you know, and 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 theoretical physicist or pure mathematician, and uh, but then uh, when I was um, going through what was happening in in mathematics at the, at the time, uh, so this was in the seventies, you know, and uh, when I was very young and and was going to then the introductions to these courses, so one course really got to me because from sixteen years old. So our um, college got a, um, a a bull computer, which was a mainframe, and it was like really I was really obsessed with that uh, with uh, computing, and you know it was at the time I was with punch cards, you know binary the binary system, sort of a secret language of machines, and and all the future that it carried, and uh, so. I, I I stumbled upon a, a lecture of uh, Noam Chomsky, and uh, so first of all, this was like the most charismatic and intellectual I have ever seen. You know, like you, sometimes you meet people and you think like, you know, I'm I'm not I'm not humble, but I will never never reach even half of of their brain. You know, and he was right. And and then 
Yeah. Uh, so, and he talked about formal grammar. And uh, formal grammar was uh, basically the grammar that is at the basis of uh, our interpreters, our compilers. It's, it's how do we uh, communicate with machines? And, uh, and it needed to, you know, you needed to be, uh, let's say you needed to have a, a good sense of, of, of math and logic for that. And also to be interested in language. And, and there was a very small set at that point. Either people were doing humanities and then, you know, whenever you told them a number, they run away. <laughs> Or they do numbers, and they were not very good in uh, writing love letters. Or you know, at that that point, it was very, very, uh, uh, very separate. And uh, or, or and so I thought that was interesting. First of all, because this was he was the father of computability, computability theory. He was also you know, and he his question was either we teach machines English or we speak binary what will it be and backwards. you know like we had to so we we actually took a bifurcation you know like we we made programming languages which was sort of in between and uh, so I thought uh, that would be the right intersection because I was interested in humanities and in I was actually interested in all of it, in in everything uh, but uh uh, being able to do numbers and logic and and at the same time uh, mathematics, uh, you know, and, and pure mathematics, you know, not right. But it, but it's interesting now, though, right? Like if you think about everything happening with AI, we now talk to it in English. Like the, like the yeah. evolution of it from where it was early on, where it, it could have been zeros and ones, or it could have been uh, programming language to actually achieving what we've been able to accomplish nowadays, right? Like we know yeah. we have normal conversations, we we can chat with it, we can teach it through normal language. And it, it's phenomenal how much, how, where yeah. we- You know, I, I never actually thought we were ever going to be at that level. Yeah. And, uh, but I always believed in the future, but you know, you think that the future is, is something, a message you send to people you will not, uh, see anymore you know because you're dead <laughs> you know i could there is the the far future or the deep future but uh um and it's amazing how now in retrospect the mistakes that we made you know if we didn't make them uh, we would have been so much further already but uh yeah you know i'm very happy to you know like i when I was young and, uh, you know, in, in the summer of my life, I went through the winter of AI. And now in the winter of my life, I've been able to go to the, the summer of AI. Uh, right. Actually good because uh, I always, people always fear a bit in, you know, what is, what's going to be the winter of my life? Am I going to, but then something just happens and, uh, you know, everything you've done sort of makes a little bit more sense to, to the world. <laughs> Right. So, so from school, um, your career then progressed, right? Yeah. And can you tell, talk to me about when you met your wife and, um, uh, and from there you guys choosing to start a venture together? Like, can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. In, uh, 86, um, uh, I wrote the book on, uh, um, a machine translation, you know, how can a machine translate everything? Uh, and, uh, you know, with, with, uh, very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, mistakes that the machine made. For instance, like uh, I remember, uh, like we we translated something from Korean and translated. To, you know, it was like here you can. Um, uh, it was for donkey rides, you know, in the mountains, and then the, the, it it came back as here you can ride on your own ass. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly off, but kind of correct. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, I wrote the, the book in uh, 1986. Uh, it was a textbook for university. And uh, then in 1988, I, uh, I finished the book on Lisp, you know, which was then the programming language for, for AI. 
And and in uh, in eighty eight, um, so a lot of things have happened because that by then you know all my students sort of disappeared, and uh, because I gave transformational generative grammar, which was Chomsky grammar, basically he wrote a book in fifty seven, um, and uh, so yeah, I decided that it's time to leave university and to you know go into the real world because. In the beginning, as a um, a theoretician, you know, like you, we want to stay at university as long as possible because it's it's cozy. It's you know, you have your you know how how the world works and and uh, so in um, eighty nine, I went to live back with my parents, and it was actually great because you know, like you know, being independent from your parents is actually uh, overrated. You know, <laughs> so going back home. No, no longer having any costs, uh, uh, cars if you need them, uh, your mother makes a plate, so, uh, you know, don't have to worry about your laundry. Uh, yeah, so, you know, all, uh, you know, normal things, but uh, I, I I started to reappreciate them. And it was the ideal way to, to start a company. And uh, I started the company from my bedroom, which was then, uh, a company in uh, uh, that may you know in com- uh, computer publishing you know it was in eighty nine was very big in personal computers and people wanted to read magazines and so I did Unigram X uh, so which was for uh, um, uh, Unix and and Linux uh, uh, people and then uh, my, but my magazine that was really that became really big was. Uh, uh, personal computer magazine, personal com- uh, uh, a computer magazine, personal computer magazine. Yeah, um, and uh, and and uh, I had a a, um, a good mentor there, Bill Ziff, who had uh, Ziff Davis, who who taught me everything about uh, uh, publishing because yeah, I didn't actually know anything about publishing, but uh, you know which cover, what works, how does the distribution work. Uh, how does it break down? What are the margins? How do you, you know, what is normal? Because when you start, you don't know how many, you know, like how do you do that geographically? And if you do several countries, and and uh, how how much do you print? And how, you know, and so that that uh, that was that was great. And I uh, I I then met my wife in uh, ninety two or ninety three. Uh, so very. Uh, early or Leon she is uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, she was in uh, at that time in art school uh, in Holland and she came for an I had uh, companies in in Amsterdam she came for a, uh, for an internship and uh, so yeah that's how we met and uh, so that's now you know like uh, 30 years ago you know like amazing and uh, and uh, so um and I basically said, look, uh, what about co-founder for life? You know, like, let's set up the companies together. I right. sold everything I had and, and rebooted with, uh, with her. And yeah, it became, uh, we, there is a, this, uh, uh, there is 14 years, she's 14 years younger than I. And I think uh, that was the right age for me because uh, I'm, so I'm still actually uh, younger than she is. Uh, so. I think boys remain sort of get stuck at 28 and, you know, like that there must be a sort of a, you know, a neurological limit uh, to how we see life. And we're all stuck at 28, I think. And so we need mature people <laughs> to, to guide us. So, so then you guys um, started your, you started now your, at this point of company together. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that, the initial ventures and, how did that no. progress? Was this in healthcare or what was this? No, it was in publishing. Okay. Uh, but a very, very early. So we published a magazine that was also connected to a magazine in San Francisco called Mondo 2000. And we we uh, published Wave magazine. And Wave was the uh, precursor of the, in- we, we, we said the internet is coming, you know, like uh, because more and more. And then, you know, all our life is going to change. And, uh, so this was a very advanced magazine, and because I did that, I started to meet other people who uh, were also because I, I had stayed at university as a as an adjunct professor, you know, like not not really uh, 
you know, on the payroll, but uh, you you have all the uh, facilities, as I have now actually also with Stanford, but you are not paid, you know, right. like, and, and so that, uh, uh, because I, I don't like to operate without a university. Uh, I, I've never been able to, to dissociate myself from academia. <laughs> and uh, so... Um, uh, I so you're currently teaching at you're currently teaching at Stanford, right? You're, yes, you're in, okay. And, and what do you teach at Stanford today? Oh. I now do uh, 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 so I just did an entrepreneurship course for uh, uh, postgraduates, you know. Like, uh, uh, but uh, and now I'm uh, uh, next year I'm going to do an AI course for uh, medical students. Amazing. So, yeah. so when did you first discover healthcare as a whole? Well, like I, I know some of your career trajectory because it sounds like you were in publishing at this stage. When did healthcare become of an interest to you, and then what? How, how did you discover that? Well, the first was uh, you know of the magazine. I started to meet other people from the Linux Foundation because the Linux Foundations were set up, and right. we we combined the twenty seven Linux Foundation into one big company, and we made you know, what is now called, you know, part of the backbone of Europe. And uh, at that time, we didn't have the the word, you know, we just called it a network. And, um, uh, and yeah, it was, it was messy because you had to do all the telecom lines from all these countries. You had to put them together and, and then take IP from uh, AT&T from, uh, you know, over the ocean and put it on there and TCP IP and, you know, and that. See that people had an interface, and uh, so and that became uh, uh, EUNet was a big company. We wanted to go to the London Stock Exchange, but we were bought by uh, Quest Communications in uh, America, and we went from Nasdaq to NYSE. So, you know, at that point, I learned to know how London Stock Exchange worked, Nasdaq, NYSE, and it's nice to learn new things that because you will need them later in life. But you have to go through it. You can't read it from a book, you know. Like so, you have to actively look for the adventure. So agree. Learning comes through actual experience, right? Experiencing yeah. application. Yeah. Like you might read something theoretical, or you might read something in a book, but if you don't apply it, there you definitely have a learning. Yeah. And then in uh, ninety uh, um, three, we because we needed so many engineers, we set up. Uh, I sold all my magazines to VNU by that. And uh, I set up a company called um, Jobscape, you know, from Netscape, because we needed a lot of jobs. And our slogan was, uh, we are only advertising jobs on the internet, because if you don't have an email, we're not interested in you anyway. You know, so we got a lot of, uh, so this became a very big IPO. Uh, uh, so we did uh, a lot of stock exchange and the Oslo Börse, you know, the, the in Norway. At that time, you... You couldn't do dual listings, you know, like you had to do, or you had to do dual listings. Yeah, you couldn't do one. And uh, so um, then we are uh, 96. I was very interested in uh, MIT, and I thought, like, I'm going to sponsor MIT to see how MIT works, uh, you know, to some fresh ideas. So uh, we we spend a lot of time in Boston. And uh, uh, Nicholas, is, is that the draw of acad academia for you? I, I know you mentioned that you're you've always haven't been able to separate yourself out. It is in, is it the fact that it's an environment that encourages new thought and and new and yeah. always like this the you know there's new students coming in, there's professors doing research, and the combination of the two, the symbiote, you know, you're able to think about new ways that you might have not seen something before. Is that what draws? Yeah, you? I'm. I'm a, actually a, a very lazy person, so I need students that I have to teach, and then I structure my ideas while teaching, and and that's how my discipline actually works. Yeah, I, I can relate. It's similar to to me when when I were teaching any of our academic courses yeah. or growth marketing. It's like the combination of the two helps you almost. Not only come up with new ideas, but it gives you a little bit more clarity on what yeah, yeah, yeah. you're trying to articulate. Yeah, because you have to make it clear for them. So yeah. you have to do the 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 work in your mind to also make it clear in your mind. Otherwise, you can't transfer it. You know, and um, and, and 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 sometimes while you are explaining it, you come up with new ideas. You know, like uh, 
And then the students also, you know, you can set up little groups with them where they are interested in that. And um, I, I like to do that. Let's take like, uh, for instance, I now have the group on uh, 6G. Like, uh, let's, let's uh, you know, uh, we are only four in, you know, four people. And uh, uh, so we mean nothing, you know, on the scale of 6G. But let's become important. Well, how do we do that? <laughs> it's a sort of adventure, you know, like, uh, and then, uh, uh, because for, I, I, I uh, used to tell my students that uh, uh, in the beginning of a, of a course, like write your Wikipedia page when you're 65, right? And then start to do it from now. You know, that's your to-do list. I love that. So like, where do you want it? Where do you want to be? Yeah. And then what are the things you need to do in order to achieve that? I love yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, by the time they are 65, probably Wikipedia will not exist anymore, but it's just an exercise, you know. No, I love that exercise. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, when, so I, I know share care, uh, let's kind of transition into the story of share care. When did that idea come to formation and when did you guys decide to build that company? Yeah. So we arrived in, uh, in, in America, uh, well, first we were on the East coast, but we arrived on the, on the West coast in uh, San Francisco in 2011. And um, so uh, we started the first company, which was really great. This was called Scanadu. And uh, and this was about uh, the tricorder, you know, like making the tricorder as a health device because I, you know, as a baby boomer, I loved Star Trek. And uh, so I met uh, a lot of people of the cast also. And uh, uh, my main... Uh, uh, um, you know, is was uh, uh, um, Leonard Leonard Nimoy. You know, spoke there because he lived in, in mm-hmm. Berlin. It's not far, and uh, so we we had all great days together where we were brainstorming about how that would work and how that would change our society. Because if you have a very small device and you can in a in a microsecond, that device will tell you how healthy you are, or you know was. Oh, this was, uh, was was great, and he always said, "I never actually imagined that one day I would be uh, uh, signing uh, instead of autographs, signing tricorders." You know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's interesting too. Like if you think about wearables, where they are today, and oh. where they're progressing to, we're not that far off, right? Like we well, well, we could get there well, in the yeah. next, you know. Maybe even the decade, it maybe even quicker than that. Well, yeah. At the, yeah. at the speed of innovation. That oh, yeah. Yeah. Where yeah. I learned a lot there. I know where all the bodies are buried <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the analytics of, uh, of, of healthcare. And in 2016, uh, I, we, my wife and I and my team, we left the company because, um, uh, and we set up another company called Doc AI. And because AI had become so important. You know that, uh, and I did. Uh, I was the first company actually with with uh, Scanadu that really were doing, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, top AI and and uh, but not perhaps enough. Uh, we were linked to hardware, you know, and and the whole thing of AI was happening in software, and because in 2013 Word to Vec had come up. And then Carl Friston came uh, before that. And then, uh, you know, a lot of things are were happening. In 2017, the paper of Transformers was, uh, you know, and, and that's where we are now. Without Transformers, we wouldn't be here. And uh, so uh, we set up, and at the time it was also blockchain, you know, like, uh, because I believe that uh, there are three, um, uh, you know, I... Uh, Marginal cost basis. I did my, uh, one of the great things in America is also you can do whatever exam you want. And I've always been a, uh, you know, a test junkie, you know, like, you know, I do this test and then. So I also did my investment banking exam, which is called FINRA, you know, like uh, with, uh, you can do and, and you can just learn it at home and then you go and uh, you, uh, you do it, you know, like in Europe that doesn't exist. You know, like your father needs to be a banker or, you know, like here you can just, you prove it and, you know, like, uh, and it's all objective because it's on a computer, you know, like, uh, the, and uh, then you get it or you don't. And, right. uh, 
but I, it's not easy, uh, by the way. And uh, but uh, so I I believe that marginal cost bases are going to go dramatically down in the next uh, uh, three years, and that's the marginal cost base of uh, intelligence. That AI, we are there actually now. The marginal cost base of transactions, which is you know uh, crypto, because uh, uh, we need you know I just did a Fed wire. Well, I'm going to take. 24 hours, you know, it take me 24 seconds in Coinbase, you know, like to, uh, um, and, uh, and also the marginal cost base of a new platform, you know, uh, because the internet is basically legacy now. And so what we want to do, you know, the internet, we made it at the time to be fast, static and cheap. And this is exactly what we don't want now. Because fast is very, very slow now, you know, the fast and 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 static. No, we we want you know 3D, we want 4D, we want continuous functions instead of discrete functions. And and uh and then uh, you know we want we want real time, you know, like everything being transacted in real time. So these are like three distinct disruptive technologies, right, that we're talking about. We're, we're talking about AI. We're talking about a little bit about like crypto, let us say crypto or smart wallet. Yeah, they are crypto. crypto. Crypto, right? And we're we're talking potentially about blockchain, right? The new metaverse. Era. Metaverse. Metaverse too as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so we're, we're going to, to make a complete new world, you know, like, and that world will exist in cyberspace. We had that idea already in the 90s. No, people forget it because we had second world there, you know, and everyone was on second world. Harvard had even a campus on second world. You know, the banks had uh, were there on second world. We had Linden dollars. We were almost there. And then 2001 came, clack, you know, like the, uh, the dot-com bubble. And then what happened to second world? Well, uh, people thought it might be interesting to just do social media. You don't have to see people. You don't have to do experiences. You can do social photos, media. right? Photo, photos really reflect. Yeah. Yeah. The photo so, became, it became more photo static. Yeah. And now the evolution has been videos. Yeah. But the real, the real expansion of that is how do you go from video to really like being immersed inside yeah. of the world, right? Yeah. So. And I, I think that there, um, Apple will play, uh, a very important role because uh, I've seen their um, uh, their uh, what is it called Reality Pro uh, and Vision, Vision Pro I think Vision oh, Pro right? Pro, yeah. oh, I forgot yeah. uh, and uh, uh, because I only saw it in the shop you know like uh, you can try it or you can make an appointment and go ahead uh, and uh, it's not that I phone Tim Cook <laughs> it's only went to the shop um, and uh, so and uh, it's amazing. Because you see the problem with um, uh, the problem with with uh, if they do, you have to predict intent. But intent is actually part of consciousness, you know. Like, uh, well, they are now putting it there. I don't believe it's part of consciousness. But what we can do is go a little bit uh, later. And we we predict intent from your eye gazing. But if you do that, and the Japanese did it like ten years ago already, it's like it's not fun because you you know like it becomes a bit of you know like visual claustrophobia. You know like the, the, your eyes are. You know? right. and so, but what Apple has done is uh, you you don't you don't realize. It. So they go a little bit later and they go very, very granular. And your intent is just a confirmation of what. So we're talking about microseconds, you know, like, and right. I think that's the real, the real thing. And that you can put that on your head and that you see your desktop and that you can talk to it and that you can, you know, this is the stuff of science fiction movies, but also in bed that you can, you know, put it on and watch a movie, you know, like, or listen to music. So there's so many 
applications where that new world will come to us. We will. I think it is. It has been our dream since the 80s to live in a computer. <laughs> you know, like now very soon that computer will live on us and in us. I think. Uh, how far do you think we are from Meta being much more adopted? Do you, do you think we're we're three to five years away? Or you think it's that close? Or so metaverse? You mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah I I think um, I think three. You know, can be very very fast. You know, depending on how. I think Apple is going to start delivering uh, Q1. Let's give it two years, I think. Two years. Like the iPhone. Amazing. Yeah. And then that probably leads us to kind of some of the stuff you're working on today. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the project you're actively working on now? Yeah, I work on a couple of projects, but one of them is um, a, a large music model, which is very difficult because the chat GPT of music has not yet arrived. So that uh, that that large music model must must be trained, you know, like we are using not only WAF but also MIDI and we are also we are using uh, uh, stems, you know, the different instruments, but also note prediction. And we are at this point, I think five five seconds. Uh, we can look five seconds in the future. So if we have music and uh, that music knows five seconds in the future what it will bring. So like, it's a sort of time travel for music. <laughs> you know, like, it's, uh, I find it very sexy, the, uh, but it's very hard. It's uh, because you see, if it was just music, it would be okay. It's the singing. Because uh, is it able to create new music or is it able to predict what the song should be or? Uh, what is it the? Is, uh, it is able to create new music, but that's not what we are working on. We are working on, um, uh, you know, uh, the, from one to n formatting. You know, you make a song, and then the machine uh, looks for, you know, like if it formats five different genres. You know, mm -hmm. like as a rap song, as a pop song, as a country and western, as a rock. You know, like. Uh, and then it starts to, if you go on a tour and you do like 12 tours, uh, uh, Taylor Swift does that actually with a, with a big team. They do it manually. So every time they go on a tour, they have a slightly different arrangement of that song. You know, like, uh, so it's uh, formatting. And also the machine can take like a rap song and turn it into a country song if you wanted to, yeah. something like that. Or I have, a, I have the same song, uh, uh, sang by uh, uh, Frank Sinatra, who is dead, or in a duet with Frank Sinatra. So that you know, like very cool. Yeah, you, you're. It's basically everything you can think about, and the machine having it's going to turn people into producers. Like it, it'll give the it ability, you know, for you to be able to mix and match and create song as you see fit. Per se. Yeah, I think uh, so. How I. How I see the market is seventy percent uh, will be for uh, people who are not artists but uh, who are doing like karaoke or so uh, uh, to become uh, you know or or to try out artists. There will be a lot of noise, you know, in in music, you know, like uh, that's seventy percent of the market. Twenty percent of the market will be artists already who will be producer, and they will say to other younger artists or. So the consumer, oh, I, I got you, you know, like, come and uh, I'll do that for you. And the, the third uh, part, that's where we are concentrating on that 10%, that are now the big producers who will become super producers. You know, like the producers of, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, like, I won't, I won't say any names, otherwise I, I will forget. So, but, <laughs> but uh, it take all the big stars, you know, like uh, the big singers and yeah. Uh, and uh, and and then they could now it will take them one week, one full week to be in the studio for one song, you know, and and that's the good ones. Uh, so now, if you want to do it formatting, it will take them two three months. So what the machine can do is can take them 
the, it can take the machine like, for instance, uh, half a day to make a song and and three weeks to do all the formats. Wow. Imagine what this could bring. And it's the, the law of increasing returns because the more artists come to the super producers or producers who come to the super producers, the more that the super producers algorithms learn. So see, in the end, it's all about sales. And it is, you know, and the history of commerce is sales, of course. Right. This is exciting. Uh, are you partnered with anyone doing this right now? Like, the, is there, the, you, which, which, uh, was it Sony? Is, is that the one or? Uh, Sony and Universal are our investors. Yeah. That's amazing. This is an awful. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so uh, I believe we are, we're close to, because L Lyria just came out from DeepMind, uh, uh, uh Google has, uh, a music LM. Uh, music gen uh, from um, uh, Meta has come out, so we take like the best parts of of, uh, of everything and 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 then combine them and uh, yeah. So and it's looking for you know it's it's basically a research project at this point, uh, but uh, uh, if you don't do research now, you are basically doing a rapper, you know, like. Right. You you are you are playing mechanical Turk. You are uh, you you employ somebody and he sings a song and then you 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 change the voice and and then you put some music that you can only generate for you know uh, twenty seconds and you put some real so you're a sort of you know like crafting. So, so you, are you guys trying to build a model or are you guys, or is it more of an application? What well, it's model? It's a model. model? Um, um, from there will be the application, you know, like, uh, but uh, it will be more, uh, uh, you know, like on the on the the MIDI range, I think, because it starts a lot with EDM. EDM is the easiest form of music, you know, like right. It's all MIDI. Very very exciting. Yeah. Uh, so clearly, you've done a lot of amazing things, right? You, you've been in healthcare. You, you know, you've been in academia. Then you've gone into science. You've gone into um, the, you now in, I guess, in the music industry and, and what advice would you kind of give founders, um, uh, that are, you know, you're, you're clearly an epitome of a serial entrepreneur who, who is over and over and over again, has had a wonderful, successful, a track record. What advice would you give founders and what do you think has led that for you? Like, it's like, I, I know earlier on, you mentioned it's the curiosity of learning and, is there anything else that other advice that you could provide to, uh, for founders listening in? Yeah, I would. Um, well, uh, so there is so because we we set up companies in like five continents, you know, uh, and so everywhere we come, we are basically strangers. Now we are citizens <laughs> of America, but uh, uh, it's um, it's easier to get money in uh, the place you are born, you know, and where your father means something and and he went to the same university and you know, you know, if you are arriving, you know, parachuting into Silicon Valley, which we have done in, in you know, we have this done the same in, in uh, with, uh, with Wall Street and now in Hollywood, you cannot really count on VCs because you know, you you don't fit the profile, you know. So you shouldn't be, uh, you, you know, like uh, when they say no, it it shouldn't impress you, uh, because they can't help it. They have their their profile, you know, and they don't even know it because you know the 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 golden age of VCs is basically over. The big VCs like uh, Mark Andreessen and, and so they set the tune. You know, but now, uh, and and uh, so, and they they taught a new generation. But that new generation now just takes the profile what they would have done twenty years ago. But there is data drift. You know, like you cannot just profile. You have to look at. You have to to meet everyone. Also, the ones that you think 
they do not fit the profile because that's some sometimes where the treasure is. And I would also say that uh, um, to founders that uh, uh, a failure is very common, and you know it's it's a, a, a learning a learning moment, not a fun one, uh, but. Um, there are always people, and and ninety percent of the people, although they say, "Oh, failure is okay," it's not true. Failure is not okay. It still hurts, right? Yeah. It's it still hurts. Yeah, but you will find five percent who will still bet on you for a second time because an entrepreneur who failed and has a family and has to start again, that company will make it. Because he they have more on the line, right? They have a lot more on the line. They're with their back against the wall and they will make it. And they will make it big. And so, and most people make, um, you, you know, like uh, when when somebody fails, then so, suddenly, you know, nobody answers your phone calls. <laughs> and then when you're back in the news and when you're on everyone, why is that doctor? All of us say, hey, what the <laughs> oh. <laughs> Like, where were you? <laughs> yeah. And uh, also, nobody talks about the fact that this is an experience and you make your hit and shit list, you know, like, you know, who can you depend on and who should you... I always, you know, I helped uh, many people and uh, I think you can always count on, on 5% that something comes back, you know, but not on 95%. You know, most people have... Expected uh, their expectations are not correct. And so, so when you help people, uh, it's good, and you should feel good, uh, and not only think of your personal gain. And then five percent will come back, not immediately, but perhaps like a year. I love that. Just help for the sake of helping them and providing value to them, and no. not expecting anything in return. No. And no. I love that. No. And uh, and any uh, final thoughts on where? You I know we talked a little bit about the future and where you see the world going. If you were, and I know the way you're working on in the music scene today, right? Like if you were a new founder today and you were paying attention to everything happening to AI and all of those different things, what are some, what are some advice you would give founders who are starting? Because there's obviously AI companies coming out left and right. There's companies today that are embracing AI. What what would you, advice would you give that makes them defendable or unique so they they can actually be able to compete and and gain value? What are some advice you would give in that? Yeah, well, I would uh, first of all, um, you know, the idea that uh, you the CEO is an MBA and and then he will find a CTO, which he will try to lure lure in with some promises. That idea is that idea as a it's no longer working, I think. Uh, so I think you have to set yourself up as a, I need to know everything, you know, and 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 the, that confidence will get you far. And there's so much you can learn on YouTube now, you know, like, uh, and uh, so uh, if you want to to now uh, learn a new, uh, like if you want to learn about AI, I, I did a bet with uh, my students and uh, I said, we're going to do um, for three weeks, you know, an experiment. So you choose a field and we chose a field in AI and you're going to read uh, every morning, you know, uh, uh, 40 minutes uh, on AI, then you come to the course and every evening you will read 40 minutes. And then after three weeks, I'm going to put you together and we're going to do a panel. And you will be surprised to find out that you can pass for an expert. Wow. Because, you know, like you, it's compounding. Yeah. It's compounding it. And also the knowledge or the information out there now, right? There's so much great information for you. Yeah. I, I won't say that you are an expert, but you could pass for one. You know, right. <laughs> the different. So mm -hmm. you don't have to start from zero. Then you know your flaws and then you know your, and then you can go further. So I would, um, uh, and of course I would, I would, I would certainly, uh, um, 
if if you are going to to study, I will certainly do something engineering or mathematics. But yeah, that's my. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, you should also do everything. You know, at university, you can do everything. Like you can follow a course on philosophy, which is badly needed. A lot of people in AI have have had uh, supplementary courses in philosophy, yeah. uh, and so, especially the philosophy of mind. You know, like uh, so. Um, yeah, that, uh, and also I would, uh, so I'm now working and most people will work like that. I think in the next year, um, I have my own team, but, uh, the team are all, um, basically AIs, you know, like, uh, I have, uh, Claude, uh, I have Bart, I have, uh, ChatGPT, I have the, um, uh, uh the the playroom you know uh, uh so and mostly i do a lot with with uh, ngpt4 of course and and basically i have everything but i i can you know like when i and i use it mainly for braincraft now i'm writing a book now and uh it, the book is about the how the philosophy of mind and the philosophy of language has actually taken over ai and has to be reformed because it's all about language. And uh, the world model that we have been looking for and didn't find was inside language. Um, and, 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 and you can compare it with, if you play games, they call it game physics. You know, the, the spatio-temporal experiences in the game. You know, like in the beginning, uh, GTA, you know, uh, you, uh, you drove over someone and the guy got back up. You know, that's not, that's not how the real world works. You know, like a collision should have, you know, should be blood. It should be no longer there, uh, you know. And, and this is all in our language because we couldn't put it in our DNA because there was no room. Uh, so we used language as the external library of our species, you know, to put all these experiences. And that's why we now are so impressed with ChatGPT because just like, you know, in object-oriented programming, we had the gorilla and the banana. <laughs> you know, it was a long time ago. So we wanted to make, make an object of the banana. And then, okay, we had it. But that object was like a gorilla hanging on it. And on the, the, on the, on, on the leg of the gorilla was the whole freaking jungle. You know, <laughs> and, you know? So, so I think we have unearthed that world model by taking all these words. Suddenly, something emerged that... That was the external library of our species, you know, like that with space, uh, uh, with uh, uh, biosensory experiences, which we can now synthesize in multimodalities. And on the other hand, uh, with um, spatio-temporal experiences, which are like games physics, and, and, and then the reasoning capabilities, which are like, which we now also have uh, done. All these things are, we are now amazed, but we, uh, you know, you can do a lot with scale. Scale can be a boon and it can be, uh, it can be a blessing, but it can also be poison. Because Amazing. Scale, well, yeah. Walter, thank you for taking the time today and sharing all your wonderful insights with us. And thank you for our listeners for tuning in to the Growth Ventures podcast. If you found this episode inspiring, please leave a review and subscribe for more conversation with leaders and business and in business and technology. Walter, if people need to get a hold of you, uh, what's the best way for them to connect? Is it on LinkedIn or? Well, uh, yeah, LinkedIn or, um, uh, so I also put my articles there. Uh, and um, uh, so for the rest, uh, you know, um, wdbrower at stanford.edu, you know, like my email. Perfect. Well, we'll make sure we provide those in the show notes. Uh, once again, I'm Hamlet Azarian signing off from the Growth Ventures podcast. Stay curious and continue pushing the boundaries of innovation. Thank you. Thank you.